Are we good? All right, we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, we'll start with number two, approval of the agenda. Tracy, and then take it by now. All those in favor, say aye. Opposed, to say. Approval of the minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, on number three, I think it's number three. Number three A, I think there's a Scribner's error because it says uh, Supervisor Nelson identified, and it is, I'm sure it's Supervisor Olson. Okay, does everybody see that change? Was that on page three, Doug, or did you say number three? Page two. Oh, number three. Okay. Three. Second, second sentence. Okay. Uh, so Doug, is, is there a second there? I'll second. I'll, yeah, I'll second that way. That in. Any other corrections anyone sees? Hearing none then, all those in favor say aye. Um, Opposed to saying, okay. Public comment, did we get some written in or anybody call ahead so that we were kind of prepared for it? Uh, do we know? Bob, did you get any? None? Yes. None? All right, do we have anybody in the West Conference that wants to speak? Nobody in the West wants to speak, Chairman. Thank you. Is there anyone then online that wishes to speak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Just, just a, a question, and I don't know if this is pertinent or not, but do we need to suspend the rules because our our agenda says there will be no option for public comment? We were looking here. Under number four, public comments, because of the nature, oh, there will not be an option for public comment. So. Do we need to suspend the rules to allow for public comment? Yes, I think so. There is that decision. I don't think you need to suspend the rules because the rules that were passed last week indicate that um, public comment may be allowed. It's not a violation of the open meetings law to allow public comment, even in a situation where public comment wasn't noted on the agenda. So I don't believe you would need to suspend the rules. You as the chair can certainly allow public comment as long as it's convenient as far as who's speaking and they announce who they are. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So under public comment, we have someone that does want to speak. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, Nick Vivian here. I'd like to speak. Okay. Can, every, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. One, wonderful. Thank you. Um, I, I've been asked to, to speak today uh, by Lisa Gore, uh, and, and Lisa has, has asked me to speak regarding uh, people operations uh, permitting ordinances, uh, and so that, that will be the, the topic. Uh, by, by way of background, uh, my name is Nick Vivian. Uh, I'm an attorney uh, with the Eckford Lammers Law Firm, um, and uh, one of my principal areas of work is, is municipal law. I serve as the city attorney for New Richmond uh, and have represented a number of rural communities, in, including uh, Deer Park, uh, Hamlin, North Hudson, um, Bayport, Minnesota, Lakeland, and Grant, uh, some of those um, communities also being along the, the river. Uh, we, also, we also do a, a fair amount of work uh, for private citizens with a primary focus on St. Croix Polk and, and Burnett uh, counties. Um, and, and so we, we've done a, a lot of work in, in this area, and I understand that this is an issue uh, that um, uh, your county has been working with and, and dealing with for some time. Um, I, I first want to say thank you to the, to the county, to your committee, uh, to the county board for the work that it's done with respect to uh, the, the moratoriums uh, that have been worked through. Uh, I know these are they're challenging issues. Uh, they require a lot of thought and collaboration with, with others, and I think the uh, uh, the county's done a, done a really good job in, in working through that, that process. 
Uh, on, a, on a personal note, uh, I also have a, a vested interest in the farming community uh, as, as I own a, a John Deere dealership up here in Mason. Um, and so supporting our, our farmers is, is first and foremost uh, in, in my mind all the time. Uh, we also advocate for, for land rights. Um, and in order for citizens to be able to enjoy their, their land, there needs to be a, a framework so others don't impede that, that right to use the land. Um, and it's particularly important in, in rural counties and, and communities where, where land use uh, is, is so important. Uh, there are a different number of, uh, a number of different ways, as, as I'm sure your corporation counsel and, and your uh, administrator have shared with you regarding uh, how you might work with, with KPOs and how you might work through the process of, of creating that, that framework, including zoning, uh, conditional use permits under your zoning uh, ordinances, and operating permits. But it's, it's important to understand that the state of Wisconsin has a, has a vested interest statewide um, in a kind of a uniform framework of, of regulation, uh, which sometimes uh, provides challenges for uh, local communities as they start to, to think through this issues, uh, these issues. I, I think it's also important to understand that, that thinking and dealing with, with KFOs is, is not an anti-farming concept. Uh, we're major farming proponents, particularly local uh, family and, and community farming operations. But what we want to make sure is that both county farmers have the right to farm the way they want to farm. Uh, and our concern primarily is corporate farms that have no connection uh, with the county, and they, they locate in, in towns and in villages in, in counties where there's, there's little regulation. So, you know, what are, what are the options? Well, zoning is, is certainly an option, but it's not perfect. Uh, sometimes zoning becomes a, a major issue because you have to think through your entire zoning map. You have to coordinate with your, your villages and, and your towns. Uh, there has to be coordination between your overall master zoning ordinances. Uh, what the towns are, are doing or not doing in the form of seating uh, zoning control for the county, uh, your shoreland ordinances, and so it, it becomes very complicated uh, to, to do it through a zoning process. Um, as part of zoning, some think that, that conditional use permits are, are the right way to do this. By the way, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, however, uh, conditional use, use permits become difficult uh, because of, of the state of the law and the, the fact that the law essentially says that if somebody comes in and asks for a conditional use permit and they, they agree uh, to all the conditions that you seek to impose on the conditional use permit, you know, there's, there's uh, language in the, in the statute that, you know, principally, you know, almost removes the discretion from, from the community uh, in denying that conditional use permit. So that becomes a challenge as well. Uh, so that's why we, we've been looking and, and consulting with, with a number of communities uh, regarding operational permitting ordinances, uh, like what I, I know that uh, Lisa and uh, others have, have suggested to county. Um, counties and, and other municipalities have powers granted to them under the Constitution of the state of Wisconsin and Section 92.15 of the statute that allow for these type of, of ordinances uh, as, as you work through the, the process with the proper evidence uh, and certainly with, with the proper background and, and support, like the studies that, that you as a county uh, have been conducting. They acknowledge the consideration of impacts on groundwater, surface water, air quality, um, climate change, odors, pathogens, antibiotics, and also property values, uh, frankly. Uh, and we're all concerned about property values and, and making sure that our property, that properties can maintain the, the value that we, we work so hard to create. Uh, but in, in general, these, these ordinances contain a number of different provisions which, which are important. You know, first of all, it's a licensure ordinance. It's, it's not a siting ordinance, so it doesn't necessarily tell, um, KFOs where they can and can't locate. Uh, those decisions are, are left to zoning, so you still have your zoning control. Uh, the, these ordinances don't, they don't tell you where you can, in fact, locate. They tell you, you know, what you need to do in order to locate. Uh, and so it requires an ordinance. It requires an application fee, which is important because ultimately you have staff time, which goes into to this process. 
uh, and that staff time needs to be covered. You likely will have consultant time uh, in the form of, of engineers and, and you know, perhaps your attorney and, and looking at, at these applications. They require a public hearing so the public can come in and evaluate the, the plans of the case um, and, and they can take and comment. Um, they require a financial surety so that if there are issues with the operation, that it's the CAFO right, that, that has provided the security to, to clean up and, and deal with any issues that are, that are out there. And then it allows for similar type conditions, uh, like the condition that you use on that process, conditions to protect the health, safety, and welfare of, of your residents, to protect the animals, uh, to protect your roads and your infrastructure, to protect your drinking water, uh, your air, your private property rights, and, and your surface water. And then significantly, it, it provides for penalties if, if there are, are violations. And, and overall, the, the whole core purpose of, of this type of ordinance, again, not to tell people where they can and, and can't locate. Uh, it's not to make a decision about whether they can or can't be in, in Polk County. Uh, it's to make sure that they're operating in compliance and in conformance with your expectations of the county and to mitigate any impact uh, if, in fact, there are issues with the, with the particular uh, particular operation. So it, it's not it, it, it's it's not even an, an ordinance that says you can or cannot operate. It's an ordinance that says if you operate and if you meet the zoning requirements and if there are, are lands within our county that fit with with your use, then we're going to have a framework in in place uh, similar to other applications that other business owners have to have to uh, request uh, so that they can. Uh, in fact, operate responsibly and consistently uh, with with your expectation, um, and and that's really the, the long and the, and the short of it. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, it, it's always challenging to have these discussions, but I I, I want to just make sure that everybody understands that this isn't about whether a capo can or can't can operate. Those are policy decisions that that you have to make as a committee. And that the board has to has to make. This is about the framework of of how they operate when they when they come in, and what controls the county has to make sure that they're they're good actors, um, and that they're they're good neighbors to the, the people that that live and own property in in Polk County. Uh, so those are those are my comments. I'm I'm happy to share more information with your administrator, with your corporation council. With members of the committee, uh, to the extent that you're you're interested in seeing some of the work that, that we've done, um, happy to be a resource. And I know that Lisa and, and her group want to work collaboratively uh, uh, with the with the county. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that, that you might have. There's a lot more uh, detail that that can be worked through. I know you have a busy agenda, and I don't want to take any any more time. Uh, but uh, if we can work collaboratively and, and cooperatively. Uh, we're certainly here to to, uh, to be a resource to the, the committee uh, and to your staff as you move the consideration of, of these issues forward. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Is there Very much. any yeah. questions? Is this is no, no, it's all the way up. Go ahead. <clears throat> we'll probably wait till afterwards for questions. Then. All right. Thank you. Good. They were all thanks. All right. Yeah. We'll save our questions till later, if that's all right, Nick. Certainly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So with that, was there any other public comment? We have room for a little bit more. All right. If not, we will move on to uh, number five, because we do have a at least one supervisor that wants to uh, talk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do you have any Hello? Can you hear me? Second? <clears throat> Can you hear if I put it down there? Second? Well, thank you for the time. Uh, my name is Amy Norton. I'm District 10 Supervisor, and I represent the town of Osceola. I'm also on the town of Osceola Planning Commission, and we have uh, tackled the care for issue in the past. Um, Mr. Chair, thanks for letting me sit in on this committee meeting today, and I know you guys have done a lot of work on this on a large scale facility study group report, and I appreciate the work of both the committee and the staff, because I know this is a heavy list, and we've got uh, a lot of work in front of us, and a lot of it has been done. 
I appreciate having this first version of the report released in such a timely way so we were able to start working on it, and I did do a deep, deep dive over the weekend on this issue. Um, I do here with Nick. I do not know Nick, but I appreciate it still the same. It's been laid out, and um, I'm, I'm interested in the work that the town are doing on this large livestock issue. Um, I think it's also great that uh, the Services Committee had a chance to hear what the town of is doing and tackling this issue of public health and property values. While we at Cook County cannot ban large-scale livestock, I understand that entirely, we can operate, uh, we can implement an operational ordinance similar to Eureka's. The decisions we make now will impact our health and economy for decades to come here in Cook County, and so I, I want to make sure we really dive in on this. Particularly, we need to make sure that our county ordinance does not allow swine factors to damage public health, pollute public waters, and destroy property values. Talk about that a little bit later. Um, I'd like to briefly mention three areas that I think need to be woven into our next study. The health impacts of the COVID-19 and African swine fever virus, the economic impacts on existing livestock industry and property values, and third, law enforcement county legal ordinance. First two uh, viruses, both COVID and African swine. In particular, Right now, we have no mortality plans required on these facilities, and we have more than 250,000 or 25,000 hogs um, potentially slated in, in this um, proposal in Cook County. Obviously, the biggest challenge that we have right now is our COVID-19 epidemic. And as we speak right now, COVID-19 is really burning through the pork industry. Our processing plants have mortality infection rates, excuse me, of up to 25%. At the last count, the CDC had said that there's more than 100 pork processing plants closed across the country, and experts predict that a million and a half hogs will have to be killed because the factory farms have no way to ship their animals. So without effective enforcement of mortality plants, Cook County is going to be vulnerable when these hog factories have to dispose of tens of thousands of hogs due to a pandemic shutdown potentially in the future. And this isn't an abstract concept. This Ginormous pork processing plant uh, in Sioux Falls, owned by Smithfield, is Chinese owned, and the same developer who owns that plant is trying to pull this deal and make a deal in, in Lake Town and Sterling, and has publicly said that the Smithfield plant is where it plans to ship its animals. What will we do with the thousands of pigs after they have to be euthanized if that ever happens? Do we dig a hole? Do we bury them? Do we compost them? Do we render them? Do we dump them in landfills? And a little bit of a sidebar, last night as I was working on this speech, my phone rings, I pick it up, and a person who works for the Minnesota Department of Ag said, do you know that right now, as we speak, 12,000 pigs are being uh, composted in South West Minnesota? So sort of the, the sort of watershed to the Smithfield plant is now backed up, and everybody's scrambling to figure out what to do with all these purposes. So we already know that disposal is a huge public health concern regarding African swine fever. And while it doesn't affect humans, we predict that 25% of the hog herd will perish because of the swine fever. The disease is 100% fatal, super hard and virus, and it's very contagious. Asian countries like China, Vietnam, and Korea have been hit hard, and it's one of the reasons that the Chinese have bought the Smithfield processing plant and is pushing for more hog farming here in our country, and that's to replace the pork supplies being lost back in China and Asia. It's only a matter of time before this gets into the American herds, and then we might have a very big mess. Pork industry groups and the U.S. Department of Agriculture have held generations last fall and identified a huge list of problems that make disposing of millions of hogs nearly impossible. We need to make sure that any hog factories built in Cook County in the river of the Cinco River watershed have mortality plans and the financial resources to back them up. The second big issue for me is to make sure that the study identifies economic impacts of these hog industries and that they have, what they'll have on our property values. By far, the property value piece was the, big, biggest, the biggest concern of people in my district and I heard about it on the campaign trail all through the fall. Most people don't know what African swine fever is, but they sure do know what a 25,000 hog operation is going to do to their property values if it's located in their neighborhood. The next version of the study needs to address this property value issue. 
but also needs to address the impact of swine industry in Cook County and will have on the hundreds of small producers and family-owned processors that we have. We have Clear Lake, we have in the Manly, St. Francis, Lux, Cedric, and we should be really looking at what those small processors' impact will be. And finally, the study really needs to give the, produ- the survival supervisors a complete understanding of the laws that govern the swine industry. This is a big, big lift, I know, but how else can we make decisions that will impact the healthy economy of our people for decades to come? I'm going to give you guys some draft, um, my draft comments and a draft summary chart, and in the back of this packet that I'll hand out, the Midtown more, the Moratorium more put together this sort of matrix that gives you a good model for all the regulations and, and components that we should be looking at. I study you often need to address and identify the important issues that current laws do not address. For example, the lack of regulations for air pollution and noise, the high capacity wells with these factory years that might dry up rivers and neighboring wells. And just as important for the study of the document, the huge problems that the DNR already has in enforcing these important laws governing the plant. As of May 11, 2020, there's 318 regulated large livestock facilities in Wisconsin. 26% of those are operating under expired permits. And no better case illustrates the enforcement problems than our neighbor, Emerald Sky Dairy in St. Clair County. Emerald Sky had five known manure violations in two years. And the worst was in 2017, with a quarter of a million gallons still that resulted in only an $80,000 fine. Things got so bad in St. Clair County that the St. Clair County Development Corporation sent a letter to the DNR in February demanding, quote, full and quick enforcement of a more application rule and statute to case located in St. Clair County, unquote. As someone who served in Australia for 12 years on the county commission, I know how our town and public are counting on the county to do this work. We need to provide a fair study on this large, large livestock issue, and I know I've, I've talked to you guys about this in the past for the full board, but it's it's really important that the county help the towns and give us some leadership so that they can roll this out. I look forward to working with you guys and appreciate the work of both the committee and staff. And thank you. Thank you. Was was this kind of under um, okay. So she's going to hand out stuff for that. Okay. So, Amy, were you the, were, I mean, was, was Amy the representative of the office department or the health committee that was coming today? No. Well, we, I don't know that that's. I was the person on the agenda that, that uh, whatever it's called, supervisors know something that they want to talk about. Okay. Yeah, just uh, so I think that's great on the agenda. I spoke with the chairman and he said whoever wants to from this committee can come speak. Not me. Yeah, I do. That would get there. Okay. No, that was not. That was it. Take care. Good morning. Uh, I'll be pretty brief today. Um, the update on the June 10th public hearing. We have two dates scheduled in June for members of the public to come in and videotape themselves. Um, that's June 2nd from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. and June 3rd from 4 to 8 p.m. So folks are going to be able to come in. We'll have, we'll have a video camera set up in here. We'll do one in, one out. Uh, the surfaces and the equipment will be cleaned after each you know, participant to ensure their safety. And we'll, we'll do that for two days. And then on the June 10th, Hearing will present that, that video to the committee. Um, that notice has been posted in the paper. It will be coming out this in this week's paper, and we'll get it online under the Stellar Trail Master Planning webpage on the county site. So that will be up. 
Uh, are there any questions on that? No. Sounds good. Sounds good. Good. Um, update on the Trail Advisory Group. We, um, Bob and myself and Tim, are going to have a meeting with Chairman Nelson and Chris Middleton, along with the County Administrator Netherland, uh, to talk about the objectives and the direction of this Trail Advisory Committee. And we're going to try and, and iron out the expectations and get the objectives of the group on the front end and help write, you know, use that to write that enabling resolution that will give the group its foundation. Uh, so that will be happening next week, next Tuesday. So I would expect to expect update a report resolution at the next committee meeting from that group. Okay, thank you. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Forestry. Okay. Although I do have a brief, short presentation. Um, another uh, update on the steering cell phone tower. Um, essentially, the old fire lookout tower is on the ground. The net has run power to that site, and they have closed the fittings for the new cell phone tower to be constructed. Uh, they closed the concrete last week, so whatever the tune time is, 14 days or whatever, uh, they'll be making hay very soon, I guess, with the construction of that tower. Um, moving on to the forest plan, I guess, uh, we have now completed our review of all the chapters. I do want to, uh, provide the opportunity to go into the this advance here. <coughs> Anyway, um, last, last time we met, we, we talked about Chapter 1000, which again is the last chapter. Within that chapter, there's a lot of contracts, ordinances, etc. Um, long term, I guess, within the plan, they is okay, because those are the ordinances that parks and forestry operate under. However, it would be nice to put on the, the work plan of the committee at a future date to kind of consolidate them. Um, just from the standpoint of these resolutions all the way from 1936 to 87 to 93 to today. Um, my thinking on that is to get them in one nice package where you can refer to it as the resolutions and the ordinances that kind of drive um, what we do and what, what's enforceable. Um, so I don't know if that's going to be on the work plan for the committee later this year, early next year. I guess I'll leave that up to you, but that'd be kind of some unfinished business per se to package it up nicely, I guess. Um, any questions on Chapter 1000? I guess uh, that is the biggest chapter. Um, there's 90 pages to it. Chapter 4 of, of contract, user agreements, timber sale contracts, etc. So I, I, I guess I, I open it up to, to questions if you have any in regard to that chapter. If not, we'll move on. Anyone can't Yeah. Uh, for other, the, the message here is the, the draft that I handed out to you in our discussions when we were reviewing this chapter, we're associated with uh, the two-to-one ratio versus the one-to-one ratio. I just want to make it clear that that went back to the one-to-one ratio, 
Um, that's kind of what I heard after discussion. So if that's not the case, then uh, I, I need to know because I, I put everything back to the one-to-one ratio. Um, along with that, that takes uh, some DNR approval. But regardless of what we do, whether it's a two-to-one, one-to-one, the DNR has to approve any withdrawal procedure. So, so am I on, on track with that? Okay. Okay. And then the the final thing is this will be the first time um, you've seen this public process type of thing. Um, you know, essentially this first plan has now been on the agenda, the environmental services agenda for I believe this is the eighth meeting. Uh, we began this journey early in January, um, some delays in, in March with the, the virus, etc. But uh, people have had their opportunity to comment on this stuff as we've been going along here. So moving forward, now that we've kind of been through this, I want to get the drop plan on the Forestry and Parks website. Essentially, at any time after it's posted, you guys will have access to it. The public will have access to it. Um, my plan is to email it to all the county board supervisors as well as well, the you guys also. Jim, um, in the past, you kind of, not to really out here, but you would probably uh, desire to have a printed out copy. Okay. Is there anyone else who would like a, a printed out copy for you? I yeah, and, yeah, and, and there'll be minor changes. I guess the, the work that I have involved now is just screwing away the, the table of contents associated with page numbers, et cetera, kind of sudden make it look a little prettier type of stuff. So. And then uh, after I get that plan posted on the, the website, Probably on right now in an open house in next July, we'll see with the other stuff going on with the virus, but I'd like to have an open house type of format where people can come in and, and comment. I plan on having four stations. You know, one would be the rear of the county forest, um, a map of the forest that cover types, the trails within the forest, and the overall management of the forest would be the four stations. And then, of course, we would handle any other public comment that, that came up. So they can do it by way of email, or the house, et cetera. That may be uh, some type of format like we're doing today. Who knows? We'll see next year. After that, I'll compile them based on the, the comments. There may be certain areas that may or may not need to be revised. Um, take care of that in July. Um, I'll come back to committee in August after that process is done. Answer any final questions you guys might have, because I'm sure your phone may or may not ring. And get your approval, be a resolution to send us to the board. And again, um, county board approval is needed at the October meeting. Um, that's kind of the, the drop dead day per se. Uh, if we can do it in September, that's fine with me, I guess. Uh, that's going to be up to the committee and uh, the county board, whether they want to send it in September, October, depending on what else is going on, etc. Um, but it does need approval in October, so that that allows the DNR, again, they're, they're approving 30 of these plans. Um, this plan has to be in play January 1. Approved by the DNR. So that's all I have for today. Um, whether there's any other questions on any other uh, chapter, that's great. And I'll make sure once I'm I'm posting it, I will get you a credit copy. Thank you. Okay. Any questions, Brad? Yeah. Um, now that I'm trying to push you faster, but. Uh, I wouldn't mind saying those dates moved up a little bit. I just, I, I worry that if we're, we're pushing that final phase of October there, um, 
it doesn't take much to go wrong because we seem to last two months for October to, 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 to disappear. So to, to me, um, if we could be approving it in August, coming to work, um, and maybe that's pushing it too fast, I would just like to try and see a bit of a little buffer in there so that we could make sure that it happens. I mean, I want to ask you really to wait yet again. I'll say speed the process up so that you can get back here and get to the county board instead of saying, oh, wait, here we are, October, we're going to drop dead day. You know, I would just assume you'll get a couple months later. So maybe we should move the house up to uh, the start of July to see what happens and start there to move it up. Would would the open house would the open house and public comment be at the same time? Correct. Yes. Okay. So would they be at the same at the same meeting? We can make this happen. I guess if the desire is to to uh, have a department board in August. I can make that happen, I guess. Um, there's no reason why it can't be posted online and have the open house at the same time. So, if, if that's the desire, I, I don't see any problem with that. We'll, we'll uh, get it to a uh, committee and county board in August. I can make that work. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I at least don't see a, a huge turnout for it. I mean, we haven't had a lot of people here Trembling thing or, you know, things are, things are going bad. So, um, but I'll go back. I just, I don't want to just push that final two days. Yeah, I'm just looking at that and, and agreeing that if, if we get committee approval of the draft in August, for example, there's no reason we couldn't put it on the August board meeting agenda. And if there is some change or tweak, then we still got another, you know, September. So I don't think Correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. I don't think that's an issue what they're asking. Get it no. Up, just to be safe. Okay. Okay. We'll make it happen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Number eight, eight, the health department. Oh. Do we, do we take a short break and see if somebody's coming? Well, it, it, I think there's been some confusion. I did talk with the chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee, and I know Mr. Rowdy had said we would like some comment, and it was our understanding, and I apologize, it was our understanding that, that Amy would be a representative of Health and Human Services. But, but you know, that was, in our mind, it was the committee's decision as to who they said. Yeah, we had a meeting yesterday, and I didn't even think to bring it up. I didn't bring it up. I'm happy to come back as a representative, but I would want to work with the chair and staff on what we're presenting. I'm happy to do that conduit, but I wasn't. Today, I'm here as a supervisor. And I'm happy to do that. We could um, we could all meet as a joint both committees. Um, I don't know what what the path. I mean, I guess I could talk to Chairman Bonaparte and the staff and see what the history on this is. Um, I mean, it might be interesting to have both committees meet, but I think having some cross fertilization and conversations is super important. Um, and however we make that happen, Vince, if you have an opinion on what the most appropriate way is, I'm just shooting in the dark right now. I'm open to whatever, but um, I'm happy to come back and be the conduit. But there might be other people much more versed in this. Obviously, Brian would need, we could be involved, probably. Well, 
the information presented to the HHS committee is the same that the information has been presented here. Uh, so the idea was, I think, did they, did their committee have a, a take on it that they would want you to be aware of? So, uh, whether it be a joint meeting, I think it'd be fine to have a representative to say, hey, based on this information by the, the Department of Health, here was our take. We just want to make sure this is our feeling about this. Is that, that's how I took it to, to go. So maybe we should put this one off to the next meeting, to the next meeting that's finished. Yeah. You know, somebody would be at least ready. Well, what if I went back to staff and the chair and said, would you guys be willing to prepare a set of comments like I did? Something like that in the back? Yeah. That, yeah, that's what we'd be looking for. Okay. And then they can have their input and, and the committee can have their input and then one or two of us can come here. Yeah. And would we do that next month? In two weeks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that went to number A then. Okay. Plan to B. Mr. Jason. Yes, I brought this to the committee's attention as I could have just gone to corporate council and discussed it, but I thought we should all have it, see what's, what I'm discussing. But I'm, my intent is here, I got a call from the Vincent Lake Association, and it, it had to do with setbacks. And they, as an association, have a bunch of equipment that they use to uh, get, take the weeds out of the lake, and they have rakes, they have a cutter, and they built a really nice shed, and they couldn't put it on the Georgetown access because Georgetown didn't want it, but the neighbor to the Georgetown access said they could have it there. So they put it, it's right, comes right down the driveway to launch your boat, but it's only five feet off of the line. Maybe it's four, but it, it's four or five. And my contention is that Jason says that with the lake classification of Vincent Lake, which is a class three, then the setback is 25 feet. Well, the lot that the, that the shed is placed on is a 100-foot lot. So this goes back to a discussion I had with uh, Jeff Hughie, and it had to do with the class, lake classification. Because on my example is I was talking to him about Ward Lake, and you have these lawfully constructed cabins at 75 feet. Then the county came in and said, no, it, the, the lake classification on Ward Lake is class two, so it's a hundred foot setback. So all the cabins that on that lake became non-conforming because they were built at 75 feet. Well, Jeff said no, they should be grandfathered in because they were lawfully constructed. Well, this hundred foot lot on Vincent Lake was done before the, the classification came in, and it's a hundred foot lot, so it still should only have a five foot setback. So I just I'm looking for the corporate council's take on this. To I, I don't understand how we can pass an ordinance and then all of a sudden people are not conforming. Well, that's when ordinance changes. When ordinance changes what is allowed, something that was allowed in the past and is no longer allowed becomes non-conforming, but it's called a legal non-conforming structure. So it's still legal. Those cabins that were built within that setback are still legal and they can remain and they can be, you know, fixed within that same footprint, you know, repairing the siding, that kind of thing. You can't expand the footprint. Um, a lot that would have previously been a buildable lot and then that there was a change, they would need to apply for a variance. And given those facts, although I don't want to speak to any specific variance application, with those facts, I would likely see that a variance would be appropriate through the Board of Adjustment. Okay, so here's my question. So this is exactly what happened on board. So over one to screen in underneath this porch because that's where they wanted to sit and speak. So he had to go to the Board of Adjustment to pay $500 because he 
So I, I, I do have a question on this. So So they built the shed, right? Now Doug you said before late classification came in. And They built the shed I did last year, and uh, they, there was somebody that I think it's not more member, but they questioned the fact that it was five feet and it shouldn't have been there. And the town, though, under the ordinance, has the right to uh, create setbacks on their roads and privacy. So what, the outcome of it was that they were going to pull the Georgetown town board. And they were going to decide if they could leave it there at five feet. But I haven't, I don't know if they met, I haven't know if they ever got back to the That was the next step when they were bringing it to the Georgetown Council. So it's kind of private road was the setback? Yes, yes, it's a private road. So that's when you move the town to the town. And the town has a land in the city right next to the road. Jason could pull it up. Jason, so, so what is what is the setback if it was built? I'll say legally. <laughs> All right. Uh, just to provide some background information, this was a compliance issue that our department received. It was a new work structure. The road that is a built landing is actually owned by the town. Uh, it was dedicated when the land was developed, as Doug said. Um, I can't remember the exact date, but the area was probably planted back in the 20s or 30s when a lot of our main lakes were uh, developed. Um, at that time, and that, the lake classification uh, system did not exist because that didn't come into effect until 1999. And the minimum lot sizes back then uh, were on the were not regulated because we didn't have show and zoning until 69. Um, so that's kind of how the lots were able to be created at a smaller size. When the county adopted the weight classification system, and that, that's when the setbacks were imposed, and the weights were classified based on um, like how many miles of shoreline they had and their volume of the water and the water clarity and the watershed size. So there were several different um, criteria that was used to basically score the lakes, and then if they fell in this range, they were a class one. If they fell in that range, two and three. Um, so the normal setback for a town road, like going down to this uh, landing, is 63 feet from the center. And that's not an arbitrary number because most of our town roads are 66 feet of platted right away. Um, and if they're not platted, then it's an assumed 66 foot right away. Um, so you got 33 feet on each side and basically that's a 30 foot setback off the right away. Um, in this particular case, and that they built the shed without a permit. Um, honestly, I don't think they knew about it or they didn't think about it. Um, and they were going to approach the town of Georgetown to seek a uh, reduced uh, town road setback to be able to keep that building there. Um, and that's something that they can allow um, them to keep it without going through the board of adjustment for a variance. Um, so that's a fairly relatively new change. Um, but just to give you uh, some feedback, I think the towns really like that. I think they have a little, a little bit more control and feel like they're a little bit more involved with the zoning and that within their towns. So um, that would also apply for the private road and that that um, authority has been granted to the towns to approve those setbacks as well. Um, so that's kind of the background of it. Um, when we have an ordinance um, and, that, and we um, adopt new changes to that ordinance, then any new developments also have to fall underneath that ordinance. Um, it's kind of like the speed limit, you know, of 65 on the freeway. Um, and that being changed, you know, I mean, and that you always got to comply with the new, new rules. Um, so that's where that is. And that, 
NR-115 um, does address substandard lots, like um, the ones out there, um, and that were developed prior to showing and zoning. There's a whole section on the NR-115-05, and basically it says that a substandard lot is a buildable lot as long as the property lines are never reconfigured or the property is never merged with another lot or if it's never developed with a structure placed across that's the property line. And that's because a lot of these substandard lots, we see a lot of people owning two and three of them, um, even within the villages in that, because we had four 50-foot-wide lots. Um, so that's how NR-115 addresses them. And we've got that language mimic right in our short ordinance as well. So the 100-foot setback no longer applies. Everything is 75 feet. So in Polk County. Right? Okay. Yeah. In order to take and uh, do what I think Doug is, is saying, you know, and that is on these lots that have these smaller lots, um, you would have to probably change the weight classification system um, for a smaller setback uh, because otherwise, um, it would be very difficult to track, like, when the lots were developed and if they've been changed throughout the year, um, then that could be very difficult for staff to administer that type of an ordinance. Um, can you scroll down a little bit there, Chad? Um, what about weight classification? I don't think that's it. Sorry. That's one four twenty nine. Vincent Wake right there. Sorry about that. So the map um, here is what Doug is referring to. Um, I didn't actually pick on the property. Um, and that with the boat landing there because uh, that would actually be worse than that. But this is going to give you the same general concept. Uh, basically, we got lots out of 0.36 to 0.4 acres. Um, some of them are larger, but the red there is showing a 25 foot side yard setback. The red along the road here, um, going like this, is supposed to be representing a 30 foot. Uh, set that off the right away of the road or that 63 feet from the center. Um, and that, if we wanted to take and make this even better as far as to see what the buildable area, we take 75 feet, uh, from the, the shore of the lake. So that would really point out where the buildable area is there. So, and that, and it'd be the same over here. And that the property where the shed was actually constructed was right on the, um, north side of that boat landing there. But we would just have a 30 foot strip along the road there instead of um, the 25. So.
Yes. Correct. And so this amendment would be strictly um, replacing the director um, roles in the subdivision ordinance and interchanging that with zoning administrator, county surveyor, um, throughout that draft. We went through these changes with you before. I can go through them again if you want. I do have that draft ordinance done. I don't think, um, really anticipate a lot of public comment on it. Um, so I don't know if you guys want to move this forward and do this in that at one of your next meetings. Or if you'd like to wait until maybe things open up and that for more public to come. I don't think anybody's going to show up for it. And I think we just set it have it. If there's a few people that can you know, be in the room upstairs or here or wherever, um, okay. I'd be surprised if we got one or two. Yep. So I think uh, Bob and uh, and County Surveyor Steve have both been able to review the ordinance, and I don't think they have any objections to it fitting into the divisional government structure. So um, basically, in that uh, signing authority on CSMs, and that would fall back on Steve, and that to make sure that they comply with AE7, the survey standards, and then all of the other kind of legwork, and that would be more through the zoning department. Um, because we got worry and stuff, so as far as doing the mailings and the notices. So that next meeting, we got enough time? Uh, no, we'd have to skip a meeting, so it'd be just two meetings all. Right. Yep. Yeah. Why don't we start the second time? So that okay. Yep. Yeah. 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 I also have a rezone application in that. Would you want to take and have that public hearing on the same day? And that, um, no, I've been holding it for a uh, while. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's going to have any objection um, in that, and uh, it has been supported by the county of Eureka in that, so, um, but it's just more of a formality that we need to get finalized. Yeah, that would be all right. Good. All right. How would you say if we're down to number nine? <clears throat> so for the next one, we'll have the health department come in. Is what we missed today, which was three days. Uh, yep. Um, based upon our last meeting, we've, we've made some changes or updates to it. Um, we have some more feedback today. Um, I guess that's my question. Would you like for us to look at some of the um, suggestions that um, were presented today that include uh, the impact of swarm keepers on property values, um, the health impacts of COVID-19, as well as African swine. Um, if you'd like for us to look at mortality rates of this current COVID crisis, um, what it's done to the pork industry. Um, if you'd like for us to add um, a recommendation or some type of uh, some type of uh, analysis of mortality planning. Um, we could add that, you know, how to dispose of hogs in the event there's this pandemic or African swine. Um, and then what we've also suggested is uh, maybe looking at and inserting um, certain laws or regulations that govern the swine industry, um, you know, what the DNR has out there. Um, how to enforce it and some of those constraints, as well as um, I think I heard new application and those best management plot practices. Those are things I heard today. <coughs> um, still a living document. Um, so, looking for some guidance there. But also, then, what Nick said too, maybe look at the Eureka. Just see what jumps out. 
Alternatively, perhaps, uh, Chairman, um, would it be, could we add an addendum just to and, and insert the, uh, the town of America's um, settlement yeah, ordinance? Yeah. Just add in an addendum to save an additional resource? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Chairman, are, are you talking about the, the ordinance itself? This is just for a study, so we just have yeah, right, information. Right. As long as you're not saying that you believe that this is either enforceable or not enforceable. I mean, as no. long as you're not asking for an opinion on whether this is a valid type of ordinance, then just for information as to what's out there. Okay. Correct. All right. We'll get on that later. Because uh, the only other plan is the subsequent meeting, I believe it's like the 26th or 27th, we would have the latest draft of the CAFO report, um, just to keep a minute there. Um, you know, yet to a little more input, um, so we're just trying to make sense of all this and what, what uh, direction you provide us in terms of drafting this, this report. I mean, if you think about it, you know, the longer this goes on, it becomes, it just comes sort of a, just a placeholder for a lot of data, uh, rather than a guiding document, um, so as a staff person, you know, we just need some guidance on the uh, the final product for the key for report. Yeah, I, I was just going to say the, the input and everything is all great, and and we hope that very shortly now we can present to you here's the accumulation of the materials that you have told us is relevant. Present it to you to say is there something else in particular on your mind that you think should be included for people to review, and then we create that document, present it to you, have a public hearing, I think, correct? Is that Would that be a next step? I think the direction in my resolution was that this committee would forward on to the county board for a okay. public hearing. Okay, so we don't need a public hearing. Gotcha. So, you know, in other words, we're getting everything we can. We presented it, and, and now it's going to keep people are going to say, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? The question is, is are we getting something really new and innovative that is going to change your minds or give you insightful information? Mm -hmm. But then can this committee say, here's a recommendation, and present that to the board? I think so. I mean, that's when we turn it to uh, what kind of ordinance we want. So that's where we're going to get to. Supervisor uh, Rodney, that was actually uh, part of the evening on the agenda. We were going to uh, revisit that, um, but we can certainly push that to the next meeting after we hear from Health and Human Services response. But yeah, Jason does does have that prepared and, and can bring that bring that back to your attention. So we are kind of on nine here, are we not? Subject matters for the next meeting, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I guess what what I would like to see this committee do is is that I, I would like to see a, I'll, I'll call it a two pronged approach. Um, <clears throat> three months ago, actually, probably Malia drafted a resolution for me to just <clears throat> put this behind us and say, "Here's what the state does." <clears throat> um, that tap <clears throat> um, DNR. EPA, they regulate CAFOs, that was it. that's what they do. Leave it exactly that way. I'm still 100% for that resolution. Having said that, I believe hand-in-hand hand with that should go, as, as Doug just said, our conditional use permit process. Um, and that, that should be gotten back to us um, and that Everybody on this committee has it and comes back and says, 
here's the one or two things within it that I can live with. Here's the one or two things that I can't live with in it. Maybe it's perfectly fine. I don't know, but let's get back on that topic again and then take those two issues to the county board at the same day. And let the county board decide at that point, does the county board want to stay exactly where we are today, letting government handle it, or or state handle it, or do we want to have a conditional use permit and, you know, then whatever it would be that, that this committee would send to the county board within that conditional use permit um, process. And anything that would amend the zoning ordinances to add a conditional use, that would need a public hearing. Um, just so you're aware, as far as timing, it could, of course, go to the county board for discussion and then go back out for a public hearing, too, so you could organize it in different ways. Right, but it can, right and, I, and I get that. A conditional use process would trigger a, a public hearing at, at, at that point. Um, but I, I think... I mean, next next meeting we'll have whatever Bob brings back to us, um, and the dog can chase its tail all day here. Um, you know, I bring my expert in two weeks ago, who's responded by someone today, who's responded. I will say, as, as a one-time, I believe, friend of mine said when this first started, Polk County is going to have to make a decision at some point. Is it an agricultural community or is it a retirement community? And we can we can chase experts. As I told somebody the other day, I can bring five experts to every meeting for an, an hour if, if that's what we want. But at some point, the county board, this committee and the county board is going to have to make that decision. Um, we talk about October being the end date for forestry. I think Corporation Council would agree. October is the end date, my understanding is, for, for the moratorium on this. Um, so we're, we're going to hear back and forth. We're going to hear, you're going to hear from me all the time from my side. You're going to hear from the other side. And at some point, we, we, we just have to do what we get paid the big money to do, and that's make the decision. All right. Amy, you had a comment? Yeah, I um I have kind of a process comment and I'm having been in Bob's position and in our a supervisor position throughout my career, I really feel for what the staff is struggling with and we don't have we didn't start this process with like a scope of work and here's what we want to do so that the committee or the board gave staff a kind of clear direction on, on where we would be going. So, like, when Bob asked us all these questions and I had my hand out, um, where it's, I don't know, do, do we put it in his pile to, to sort through what we put in there? I, I feel like this committee hasn't done a scope of work and given staff enough direction to kind of be clear on what we're after. And, and we have this amorphous kind of feel to where things are going. So that's, that's one piece of the new scope of work. And I do think there needs to be a public hearing process in here somewhere. And I don't know if it's at the board level after that, but this is too big of an issue, I think, to just kind of go whoosh all the way through the process. I think we need a public hearing piece in there somewhere. But I just, I'm just feeling for Bob, and he's asking us, or asking you guys for direction, and I'm not sure it's real clear. It's clear as mud, right? <laughs> Thank you. But there's public hearing at full. On the CAFO part in the CUP. Because any zoning changes, like Maria said, we do have to have. But the CAFO, when everything gets here, there is no public hearing. We have no already. Yeah, I don't think there's a public hearing on this piece. So um, there would be no public hearing on the CAFO report. That's just basically trying to compile what you guys have received. Oh, yeah, and then okay. what we would like to do is get a finalized conditional use process or maybe you decide that you want to do a, a, another style of an ordinance and that, but before you enact any type of ordinance change or a new ordinance, that would require a public hearing on that. But you really want to have the finalized text 
down or at least pretty close uh, before you do the, the publishing in that or the public notice so that people know what to talk about for the public hearing. Um, and that I do have and that, the conditions in that from the January 23rd stakeholder meeting in a draft. Um, and that, I mean, if you wanted to go through it quickly right now, I could do that. Otherwise, I can print off copies for you and provide it to you so you guys can review it before your next meeting. I would say we should have it at the next meeting. Yeah, that's what I would, that's okay. what I would say. I mean, then we can all look at it and. And, uh, and see what I'm, conditions yeah, are there, what might be added or not. Yeah, I, I'm gonna, still going to stick with my earlier theory of, you know, come back with the one or two things that you think are great or horrible. You know, each one of us and and work off of them because, like anything else, most of the stuff in the middle is not that controversial. You know, uh, um, or, you know, the majority agree on. Um, I think that's where if, you know, if we come back with 10, 12 different things that the committee thinks, well, I can't live with this, or we've got to, you know, add this that isn't in there, and that's what we should be discussing and not, you know, necessarily all of the things on page okay. three or whatever that's, you know. But I, I do I do agree I empathize with staff was part where they have to deal with me. Uh, uh, so so um, I, I think there's... there's <laughs> All right, I'm back. <laughs> they've, uh, they've, they've, they've done a fine job. And I would, I would just say if we're going to, uh, you know, over the months we've heard a lot about, um, land values. Um, if staff is going to look at that, then I think, um, then you have to look at the, the opposite effect of those land values. Um, having relatives that live by large operations, um, the land value does not always go down when you live next to a CAFO. Sometimes it skyrockets enormously depending upon what your property is. Okay. All right. Did that help you, Bob? Um, so am I hearing those three topic items that are introduced today? Um, again, looking at a balanced look of impacts of large-scale facilities, livestock facilities on adjacent property values, the, uh, the health impacts to animals um, for COVID and African swine. Now, this is swine specific only. Yeah. And then three, um, maybe a brief snapshot of those t and regulations that govern the swine industry. Uh, okay. Where are those? Is that, is that a meeting, everyone? I just have, I guess, not necessarily for me. I'm going to say for Bob and staff, maybe, the clarification, I think. Uh, health impacts of the animals, it's, it's a pretty broad statement. Are we looking for something more defined, more? That would be more under. We talked about, I'm sorry, um, the, uh, the need for mortality planning. Uh, particularly during pandemics, um, I suppose we could look at that. Um, maybe a recommendation or best practices on the disposal of hogs, perhaps. Um, that disposal our treatments represent that help. You know, for the treatment. Of well, that's 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 my question. I think we have laid a very we, we've, we've made it as clear as mud again as to what they should be looking for. I guess I'm just, for, for their purpose, saying, okay, guys, go down this road. You know, I mean, they're, they're again, on this issue, they're going to be at a crossroads and, you know, I, yeah. and, and maybe I'm asking an irrelevant question here, Bob. Um, you know, Animal welfare means a lot of different things to, you know, ask a hundred people, get a hundred different answers. So, Doug has a question. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to respond. The one thing that I've seen, and we, we've got 
Supervisor Milton to talk about from the health department. But all through this process, here we sit, and you've got land and water, and you've got zoning, and the third department has never been here, except one time for, for a discussion. And that, that troubles me. I mean, these people should be able to respond to some of what was said about the plan, let's say. I just don't understand how that could that process could move forward without a response. And saying, I, I know I'm being critical, but saying, well, we're 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 amending our plan from the discussion last week. Well, there was only one discussion. So there. Okay. All right. Does that cover the cable stuff? I just had one one clarifying thing. Just to clarify the the human or the uh, animal. What were you calling it? Oh, okay. Welfare piece. I wasn't at all diving into the welfare side of it. I was talking about the disposal piece. And, you know, yeah, like the African swine impacts and what happens when we've got 26,000 pigs in the watershed that we got to burn or whatever we have to do with it. I didn't, I didn't get into the welfare piece. I think that I'm muddy the water. Okay. <laughs> or, or at least partially. All right. What other business and Jason, do you have any? Forestry is good. Yeah, yeah, go through that. Um, so, uh, what we'll do is, while in our work plan, um, it is time at this time of year to look at our fee schedule to do that review and recommendations. So that will be on the next meeting. Um, we'll just, we'll keep the, um, public hearing process for the Star Master Plan uh, on the agenda. Just a little reminder to let you know how the logistics are set up. Um, the, so 6B will have an update from you, uh, for you rather, um, because that will be after our meeting with uh, Chairman Nelson and Supervisor Middleton, you know, um, to explore and clarify all the expectations of the trial advisory group and set clear objectives for the drafting of that enabling resolution. Um, Mark, we may not see Mark next week or in two weeks, um, but we will adjust the work plan to move the, um, the, uh, the final first year plan review and the 15-year approval up a month or two. And I probably had in July the consolidation of all those forestry ordinances. Uh, Tim Anderson worked with Mark in cleaning all those up. Those are, those, so the ordinances from the past, those are all in one place now. So it's, uh, it's more of a one stop shopping, but we need to look and review those. And, uh, so that'll be in July, but anyway, back to, I mean, in two weeks, um, we'll keep 8A. And it's nice to hear Supervisor Middleton will meet with staff in, in the HHS, HHS board and bring back any comments. Um, we'll include um, the review of the latest draft of the CAFO report and also include the review and consideration of the, uh, the swine Commission use permit as well. And um, beyond that, um, Chairman O'Connor, I don't see unless you want to add something else. I just wanted to, uh, should we have Amanda come in and explain a little bit on the tax deed land stuff now, how that's going to affect us and how it's going to be delayed? Uh, yeah. We can do that. Mm -hmm. Well, first the resolution needs to pass the county board. I think it's being addressed at general government tomorrow. Um, so assuming that passes and assuming all the municipalities and, and taxing districts pass something similar, um, it would not affect 
those properties that are delinquent previously. Um, however, keep in mind that there is a suspension right now in sheriff sales, in foreclosures, in evictions. So, you know, just from a practical standpoint, of getting it through the system might be delayed in and of itself. Yeah. But and it's just it's kind of public to know. They don't know what those other things. Right. So, you know, yeah. if if you want it to be something where Amanda's going to come in and talk about timing and, and, and what she sees as like a cash flow issue, or are you talking about Home making sure that... Budget, right. right. So so then there's two real things. And should this committee be the one talking to the public about that? I don't know. Um, but we can certainly we can certainly talk about it. But it will be the, the resolution regarding um, the special uh, right uh, is being addressed tomorrow at general government. That just lays it at the feet of the towns to then pass, right? If the county passed, so that it then gives the town the ability to pass it. Town, school district, any, any taxing authority. Uh, just an, an agenda question, and this is a maybe a process thing, but um, if Supervisor Middleton is going to come back in two weeks with questions from Health and Human Services, they just met yesterday. So I don't... <laughs> I, I don't know how we're going to have her in... <laughs> Uh, in, in two weeks, when they don't, you know, as, as far as the, the, the committee, I, yeah, and they meet once a month. That would be my preference because I'm not an expert in any of the public health components at all. Um, and so I agree we got a timing issue on this, so maybe we do go for four weeks out because um, the only way we could do this would be a virtual feedback from the committee emailing stuff out, um, and I'm not sure if it work that way quickly or not. Um, so that, that let's go with four weeks. Would the timing on that work? I think that's only reasonable because not only was Amy not involved in the last board's committee, uh, but it would give them an opportunity to meet and discuss and to say what is it that, that came away from our presentation from Brian that we want to make sure is brought up and have input and to invite members to come and attend this meeting. That might make sense. Do you have a calendar? Would, be, would we be meeting, would Health and Human Services be meeting the day before in a month? I mean, because I want to make sure that if the Health and Human Services Committee meets, gives input, staff and myself have time to incorporate it for a 9 a.m. meeting the next day. I don't know what, just a logistical question. And while this is looking that up, if you committee members want to email me at my county email something specific that we want feedback from Health and Human Services on, please feel free to do that in the next, whatever, four or five days. That would give Tanya some help in directing a response. Mr. Chairman, well, part of my answer to that is that help in human, they, they, came, they came to me with questions, John and Joe. So I think it needs to go to their committee on an agenda item to discuss what they, what their concerns are. Because I, I, I noticed when I checked their agenda yesterday that there was no discussion on so That should be up there. Their meeting is the 9th of May, of uh, June. Health and Human Services. 9th of June, 
and your meeting is on the 10th. <laughs> that was my question. Um, yeah. We'll make sure that gets out there. Any other that you could attend our meeting? Yeah. I just want to make sure that that committee has time to meet at, you know, 10 o'clock on June 9th. It's the first time it's been on the agenda for discussion and then come here and present something the next morning. Seems a little ambitious. However, what I would hope to do is have, like, I don't know, fly staff and myself prepare something for feedback so people read it, come prepared, we discuss it, tweak it, and come back and hear the next morning. Is that too ambitious? Since do you think that's too tight of a timeline to... In one day. Um, just, um, just want to point out, June 10th is the public hearing for the Scholar Master Plan. So, we should get a gallery where that's agenda with that alone. Yeah. Um, just for your consideration. Yeah. So, for the 17th, or the 24th. Then, so that way you'd have the ninth in, in HHS to discuss it, and then we'll have them present or, or share their thoughts on the 24th of June. Okay, so Does that work? the HSS and staff are going to come back on the 24th, and then we do pre that presentation happens at that. Okay. Yeah, I, and again... It's not information that you all haven't seen. It's rather, I guess, what you can do in the HHS committee is to say, what are, the, what are the key points, what are the key takeaways that we want to make sure are emphasized from our perspective when this committee makes a decision? Okay. As, as you were appointed to do. So would it be then just, and I don't care, would it be just off of Brian's comments? And his, uh, what, his presentation to Health and Human Services. They will have information. They will have the information that, that Brian presented, but they'll also have the full report. And they can look at that, and I would suggest that be something that, if they have comments, anything dealing with health, that they could say, hey, we want to give some input. That would be at their discretion. So should we still work on the CPU and why we're doing this? The um, that will be on the subsequent agenda. Yeah. Okay. So is in the next agenda, Bob, you mean? That will be on the agenda. Mr. Chair, we probably want to take an order off on the Chapter 18 subdivision ordinance. Uh, hearing and a rezone hearing then probably till the second meeting in June if they're going to have a public hearing on the tower on the end. So, oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. It's not urgent, so. Yeah. Okay, so the, the, the individual in the public hearing is not very person. I mean, they're not. No, there, there, there's there's any hurry. Much on its 
plate? Are there some things that might be better suited in other committees? And that's that's something that maybe the executive committee needs to get involved with, with along with all the committees to say, are, are, is one committee getting the burden of long projects, and is there are they appropriate within their divisional structure? So that's something to consider. I would like you to new extension on our next agenda. Just a discussion. Yes, and Let's go A and Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go specific. I'm fine with specific. Let's go. Plus A, agent, so we can talk about the whole department. Um, statutorily, this. Committee only has supervisory or, or reporting authority over the agricultural part of UW Extension. Just so you're aware. Okay. Are you sure? Yes. We fund them, so we do have oversight because if we cut their funding, they don't have 4 H or anything. So they would still be under a salad, would they not? They are not a county department. Correct, but they're funded by the county. And the, the agricultural part is what is statutorily assigned to this committee. Okay? The rest of it is not assigned to this committee. So we need to shut the rest of it all completely down? I'm not saying that. I know you would. Okay. This is just a clarification for some questions. I'm asking for a clarification because we've got an update on yesterday yep. and there is no age. My understanding there is no age. Is that what you're asking or yeah, that, that's that, that, that's what I'm asking and I'll just I didn't want this week instead of in two weeks I think because of the way things are financially and and you know the the, the system that we're in right now I think I think we as a county should look at not filling that position. We're not filling non-essential positions at the county. Um, and I think that's something that the county, and maybe it's not this committee, but I think the county should be looking at somebody will say, well, it's $15,000 a year. It's, it's irrelevant. You know, $52 million budget. I, I think it's, it's all relevant. Um, and, and they're again, not, not saying that we shouldn't, but it's, it's vacant, and I think, you know, I, I think it's a discussion that we should have. Um, that's this committee or somewhere else. I think that should be then sent to the executive committee to talk about rather than this committee. And I don't want to get too far down a rabbit hole on something that isn't noticed on this one because you're kind of getting into some real major issues. So I would just... It's just, I would yeah. bring it on the agenda. Okay. Put it on the agenda. We'll still discuss. She overruled it? No. Anything else? Just just one, and it's, it's not for the next meeting, but as we look towards the 10th, so we could add to it at the next meeting. I think we need something on that June 10th meeting. Maybe we've only got a half an hour of public comment, you know, on the scholar, or, or an hour. I mean, we need to add something that I'll say could be deleted if all of a sudden it's three hours of public comment. You know, that, that, Type of thing, I'll say. You know, now they're good. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's just Are we good? I make a motion to adjourn. Oh, good. I'll second it. Oh, you take the eye. Yeah, no. We can't leave. We're going to do it. And it took us longer than usual.